J. Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. Let's begin this episode with some fond, or maybe not so fond, memories of your school days. Remember how teachers would walk up and down the classroom with a stack of papers in hand, placing them face down on the corner of the desk? Maybe it was a graded homework assignment or a quiz or even a test. Sometimes they'd pause right there at your desk. No sign of any kind as to how well you did and with a bit of suspense and drama. Then you'd turn the paper over to reveal a letter grade. And then there were the report cards, which carried with them a whole different set of anxieties. Recognized as one of the first schools to implement the letter grading system in the late 1800s, Mount Holyoke College in South Hadley, Massachusetts, defined their original letter grading scale as A, excellent, B, good, C, fair, D, passed, and E, failed. E. Ever wonder what happened to that E letter grade? Did you ever even see an E? For most of us, it was A, B, C, D, or God forbid, F. Sometimes there might be an S for satisfactory or a U for unsatisfactory. We might also be graded for our effort, but few of us ever saw an E on a quiz or a test or a report card. So whatever happened to that E letter grade? After Mount Holyoke began using the letter grading scale, it became popular across colleges and high schools alike throughout the country. Soon, though, schools bypassed the letter E and went directly to F, apparently because educators were concerned that students and their parents were mistakenly thinking an E stood for excellent or exceeded expectation. Really? Do you think anyone ever mistook an A for awful or abysmal? Well, either way, the E fell by the wayside and the F replaced it as the most dreaded letter in the alphabet for students of pretty much every age. Here's something else you may never have wondered about, but soon you'll know. Why do so many people pay so much attention to their lawns? It's almost an obsession. According to the Washington Post newspaper, there are an estimated 40 to 50 million acres of lawn in the continental United States alone. That's actually nearly as much land as all of the country's national parks combined. And every year, Americans spend tens of billions of dollars in an uphill quest to keep their lawns tidy, green, and, wood and weed free. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, reports that maintaining those lawns uses nearly 3 trillion gallons of water a year and about 60 million pounds of pesticides. And data from the U.S. Department of Transportation reveals that we use about 3 billion gallons of gasoline to run our lawn and garden equipment. That's said to be about the same as 6 million passenger cars running for one year. It's also been said that lawns are the most grown crop in the United States, yet they're not a crop you find in your local market. By the way, there's three times more lawn than corn or any other irrigated crop. So with all that in mind, do you ever wonder why we even have lawns? The short answer is that they're there to make us look and feel good about ourselves. Some say the condition of someone's lawn reflects their status or sense of status, both in the neighborhood and in their greater community. A lawn is often seen as an indicator of a person's socioeconomic character and success, and that in turn translates into, into property and resale values. Lawns have been called a physical manifestation of the American dream of home ownership, an indication that you have either the time or money to achieve a perfect lawn. The early colonists found no pasture grasses of any kind because they simply weren't native to the East Coast. In New England, grasses were mostly annuals like marsh grass with a low nutritional value for grazing animals. The result was that once cattle brought from Europe grazed the land, 
native grasses disappeared, and many of the animals died of starvation or from eating poisonous plants in desperation after those first winters. Changing gears, did you ever wonder why we're one of a very few countries that don't strictly follow the metric system? In fact, we've doggedly resisted the metric system for hundreds of years. As you know, in the United States, we generally measure distance in inches, feet, yards, and miles, and weight in ounces and pounds. It's referred to as the U.S. customary system. There seems to be a real disconnect between America and almost everywhere else when it comes to the metric system. In fact, there are only three countries in the world that don't use the metric system. The U.S., Myanmar, also known as Burma, and Liberia. Strange bedfellows indeed. So why is that? You know, if you look at the dashboard of almost any car, you're going to see the speedometer. And that speedometer may say MPH or KPH. Depending upon what country you're in, your travel speed is going to be measured in either kilometers or miles per hour. Take a look at a bottle of water or soda. It may say 10 or 16 ounces, or it may say 1 or 2 liters. And have you noticed that the wine and spirits industry abandoned fifths for 750 milliliter bottles? Your prescription medications provided in milligrams. Take a look at those nutritional labels on what you buy at the grocery store, the ones that list information about calories, fat, sodium, and the like. Those labels are in terms of grams and milligrams. And that's the metric system. That local road race, it's called a 5K for a reason. It's five kilometers long. So why is it that America hasn't fully embraced the metric system? Well, the simple answer is that the overwhelming majority of us and American businesses, we've never wanted to. The gains have always seemed too little. And the goal, well, let's say it's been called too purist for our American ways. The original metric system was developed in France during its revolutionary days. And it really was radically decimal. So much so that it divided the day into 10 hours. And our country's first Secretary of State was Thomas Jefferson. He was charged with deciding what set of measures would be best for our young nation. And he rejected the radical metric system because he found it to be too French. And yet Jefferson had been instrumental in creating the dollar, the first fully decimal measure any nation ever used. By the 1970s, most of the rest of the world, including Great Britain, which had been a holdout of sorts, adopted the metric system so as not to fall behind in the global economy. To keep current with the international economy, it's become necessary for businesses to now use the metric system, at least in part. Liters, milligrams, milliliters. And here's one for the category of, I never really gave it much thought. Did you ever wonder why traffic lights are red, yellow, and green? The idea that red means stop and green means go affects more than just traffic light colors. We've been taught from a young age that red means danger while green means safety. But why were those particular colors chosen for traffic lights in the first place? It's been said by some scientists that nature uses red as a warning color of sorts because it stands out most vividly against the green background of nature. Thanks to its long wavelength, red is one of the most visible colors in the color spectrum, second, in fact, only to yellow. Red appears to attract attention because of its urgency, and it's long been used to convey danger in a non-literal way, as in, for example, describing financial loss. We say a business is in the red when it suffers losses. We refer to a red flag when we want to convey that something could be amiss. And we tend to associate red with negative, danger-bearing emotions. It could be said that's because it's the color of fire or blood. There's the expression, seeing red, thought to be based on the physical characteristics associated with anger when your face and neck turn red. So we can understand where red for stop probably comes from. 
and often known as the universal color of nature. We often associate the color green with harmony, freedom, healing, and safety. It's the color of the grass and the leaves on the trees, and it often symbolizes life and the environment. It's also thought to be less intrusive a color as red or yellow, and it has the ability to blend in while still being recognizable. In many industry facilities, green is often used to designate safe areas and first aid equipment. The first railroad signals in the 1800s were the precursors of our modern stoplights. Like modern traffic controls, they contain three lights, one for stop, caution, and go. But the original color scheme was different than what we're used to. Red meant stop, green meant caution, and a clear or white light meant go. The system of color-coded signals remained in place for decades until it became evident that while using white or clear for go caused some serious problems. It's been said that around 1914 an incident occurred when a train signal's red lens fell out, causing it to appear clear or white. And as a train approached the signal, it was supposed to stop, but didn't because it looked like a clear light, meaning go. After a horrendous train crash, the accident pointed out the dangerous flaw in the red, green, white signaling system. And so the color for go was changed to green. And to provide the most contrast between red and green, and because it's actually the most visible color in the spectrum, yellow was chosen as the new color for caution. And after the automobile was invented and went into mass production, it became clear that a similar signaling system would be needed for our roadways. And so the railway system, red, yellow, green, was embraced. By the way, in the early 1900s, stop signs were often painted yellow because it was too hard to see a red sign in poorly lit areas. But after the advent of reflective materials and red stop signs being born with reflective paint and material, stop signs changed to red. But since yellow could be seen more clearly throughout the day and night, especially in school zones, some traffic signs and school buses were painted yellow. Speaking of school buses, did you ever wonder why they are uniformly painted the exact same shade of yellow throughout the country? Years ago, kids were transported to school by pretty much any kind of vehicle. There weren't any state or federal standards. It was up to the individual local school districts to hire whatever type of transportation they saw fit, painted whatever color. And a national conference organized in New York City in 1939 made up of educators, transportation officials from every state, and bus manufacturers, one of the goals was to improve and standardize the American school bus. And one of the standards that came out of the conference was an agreement that all public schools in the country would be painted the same color, what we've come to know as National School Bus Glossy Yellow. It was decided that the standardized color had to be something that was easily visible from a distance and distinctive enough that whenever anyone saw it, they'd instantly recognize there was a group of children going someplace. No lag time in deciding if it was or wasn't a school bus. It would be almost reflexive. See a school bus with certain characteristics and know that there are children on board. And so it was that yellow was thought to be the most obvious choice because yellow is one of the colors most easily seen by the human eye. So that begs the question, if yellow is the most visible color for humans, why aren't all fire trucks, rescue vehicles, and police cars painted yellow? The answer goes back to the turn of the 20th century and the Ford Model T. It seems that red was chosen for fire trucks because in the early days of the automobile, most cars were black. And so red, which was more expensive to produce, helped fire trucks stand out. So far, so good as to why fire trucks are red and not yellow. But because we came to learn over the years that yellow is a more visible color than red, why aren't they yellow? There's actually an interesting answer to the question. It seems that in the 1970s, a group of researchers considered the same thing. And so there was a push among industry leaders to change the color of fire trucks from red to yellow. 
a number of municipalities in the country began repainting their trucks some kind of yellow. Dallas was just one city that did so. And what followed was something of a surprise. In those municipalities that were studied, the number of accidents involving fire trucks actually increased rather than decrease after they'd been painted yellow. The reason? Well, studies revealed that paint color was not the only factor in preventing accidents. One of the principal factors, it turns out, was the ability of drivers to instantly recognize the type of approaching vehicle. And because fire trucks have for so long been painted bright red and have traditionally been readily identified in the minds of most drivers, that immediate connection outweighed the benefits associated with the increased visibility of a yellow fire truck. So from a scientific and visibility perspective, yellow may be the better choice. Because we've come to expect fire trucks to be red, we instantly react to seeing them red. Today, fire trucks are often painted two-tone. They're red enough to elicit that instant recognition, but have a secondary color, often a fluorescent yellow or white or a lime green, to increase their visibility and better reflect light at night. Switching gears again. Did you ever wonder where certain nicknames came from? Not just for people, but for cities. There's the City of Light, that's light, not lights. The Windy City, the Big Apple, Bean Town, Sin City, we know that's Las Vegas, Motor City, Detroit, Steel City for Pittsburgh's steel mills. Let's go back to the City of Light. As you probably know, it refers to Paris. It's said that Paris was among the first European cities to use gas street lamps back in the 1860s making literally a city of light. At first you may be thinking, ah, yes, that makes sense. All those sparkling lights bedecking the Eiffel Tower, the bridges, the outdoor cafes. The truth is, though, it's not quite as romantic as that. Going back to the late 1600s, when Louis XIV was the king of France, it seems that Paris was not only rife with street crime, it had the highest rate of homicide in all of Europe. So the king appointed a new lieutenant general of police and charged him with responsibility for making Paris safe. Apart from quadrupling the number of policemen, he ordered that there be more lighting in the city. And so lanterns were installed on every street corner. And Parisians, they were asked to light their windows with oil lamps and candle in an effort to reduce crime and to help prevent criminals from hiding in dark alleyways. And so it was that Paris became one of the first places in Europe to adopt widespread street lighting. It became a city of light. And then it's also said that the name gained greater popularity during the mid to late 1700s, known as the Age of Enlightenment, when Paris became something of an epicenter of ideas and education, inspiring philosophers, poets, scientists, and engineers. Coinciding with this enlightened view of the world was the steady increase in electric power. So it seems there were a multitude of reasons why Paris became known as the City of Light. Here in the United States, if you asked most people what the Windy City is, they'd say Chicago. But just as certainly they'd be mistaken as to the reason why. Most people believe it has to do with the blustery, unpredictable weather, probably as a result of the lake effect from Lake Michigan. In fact, though, if you look at a list of the windiest cities in the country, Chicago's nowhere near the top of the list. Boston ranks higher than Chicago. So why the nickname? Well, it seems we can thank politicians and not the weather. It's said that there were a large number of political conventions held in Chicago in the late 1800s, and there were, to put it simply, the location of more than a few long-winded politicians filled with hot air who could best be described as windy. And the Big Apple? You'd probably say New York City. And although New York State is one of the top 10 apple-producing states in the country, the nickname for New York City has nothing to do with that. Story goes that the expression, the Big Apple, dates back to the 1920s, when a newspaper horse racing reporter used it as a slang term to mean big shot 
with regard to some of the racetracks in the New York City area that he referred to in his columns. The nickname stuck, and soon the Big Apple was used for pretty much everything having to do with New York City. One last one, closer to home here, Boston, Beantown. You can probably guess the origins of this one, and that would be Boston baked beans. Beans and brown bread were long a staple in colonial New England. It may well have been that baked beans and the original bean pot were Native American inventions adopted by the English colonists. We know that the early settlers and Puritans strictly observed the Sabbath and neither worked nor cooked hot meals on Sundays. So they'd often bake beans on Saturdays in a bean pot, leaving them in the hot brick ovens overnight so that they could be served on Sundays. Speaking of Boston and nicknames, are you familiar with the Boston Bean Eaters? In 1871, the Boston Red Stockings were one of nine charter members of the National Association of Professional Baseball Players. The team won six of the first eight pennants in baseball history. A few years later, in 1883, the team changed its name to the Boston Bean Eaters, in part to solidify their relationship with the city of Boston and in part to distinguish themselves from the Cincinnati Red Stockings. The name was changed again in 1907 when it was sold to the Dovey Brothers. They chose the somewhat unbaseball-like name, the Boston Doves. And a couple of years later, 1909, when the team was again sold to a fellow by the name of William Hepburn Russell, he, with great humility, changed the name to the Boston Rustlers. By 1912, they became known as the Boston Braves. In 1953, the team moved to Milwaukee, followed by a move to Atlanta. And while some nicknames can offer a glimpse into who someone is to those who know them well, others may be given to them affectionately by a parent or sibling, insensitive classmates, the media. Nicknames can communicate a kind of familiarity with the person, even if we don't want them. But not all nicknames reflect lightheartedness or affection. Think Alphonse Al Scarface Capone. Capone, one of the most notorious gangsters in the United States. He was the co-founder and boss of something called the Chicago Outfit. Ever wonder about that nickname, Scarface? It came from an incident that occurred while Capone was working the door at a Brooklyn nightclub and supposedly inadvertently offended a woman. Poor choice. It seems because she was her, with her brother, a man by the name of Frank Galluccio, it seems that Galluccio sliced Al, Carpone, Al Capone's face. And it's well known that Capone hated the nickname Scarface. And whenever he was photographed, he'd hide the scarred side of his face and say, it's a war wound. Then there's Joseph Joe Bananas Bonanno, the alleged boss of the Bonanno crime factory. Uh, I'm sorry, crime family. He was nicknamed Joe Bananas by the newspapers, a reference to both his nickname, name, and the perception of his mental status. As a result, the entire Bonanno family was sometimes referred to as the Bananas family. It's no wonder that the Bananos hated the nickname. And ever wonder where former President Richard Nixon got the nickname Tricky Dick? Well, it had nothing to do with the Watergate scandal of the 1970s, and instead goes back to 1950. At the time, anti-communism sentiment was at a nearly hysterical pitch in our country. There were government loyalty boards that investigated thousands of federal employees. Hundreds of screenwriters, actors, and directors were blacklisted because of their alleged political beliefs. A majority of states required teachers and other public employees to take loyalty oaths and countless libraries throughout the country pulled books from their shelves that were considered to be too leftist. Robin Hood, think steal from the rich to give to the poor. Thoreau's Civil Disobedience, John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. The era was known as the Red Scare or McCarthyism because of Senator Joe McCarthy. And it was in that feverishly anti-communist setting in 1950 when Richard Nixon ran for a U.S. Senate seat in California that he shrewdly labeled his Democratic opponent a communist sympathizer, choosing his descriptive words very carefully. 
She, in turn, responded by dubbing him Tricky Dick in reference to Nixon's use of political trickery to gain political advantage at any cost. Although Helen Gahagan Douglas may have lost the Senate election to Nixon, her nickname for him lasted throughout Nixon's lifetime and beyond. On the other end of the spectrum, did you ever wonder why Abraham Lincoln was called Honest Abe? It seems that the future president was first called Honest Abe when he was working as a young store clerk in Illinois, and legend has it, whenever he realized he may have mistakenly shortchanged a customer, even by only a few pennies, he'd close the shop, deliver the correct change, regardless of how far he had to walk. His wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, once wrote that, quote, Mr. Lincoln is almost monomaniac on the subject of honesty. And you may not be familiar with the name Anna Mary Robertson, but you probably know her nickname. Born in 1860, she left home at a young age, married, gave birth to 10 children, and worked on her family's farm helping to support her family by selling lemonade and homemade foods. She disliked spending time knitting and sewing often thought of as traditional pastimes for a woman of her generation. So she began entertaining herself and her friends by making needlework pictures and quilts, portraying colorful scenes of farm life. At age 78, when arthritis rendered her unable to embroider, her friends suggested that she try painting instead. So working with whatever materials were at hand, including house paint, She'd often portray nostalgic childhood memories of fields and storms, barn dances, holidays in rural New York and Virginia. After one art critic noted that her neighbors called her Grandma Moses, the name stuck. And so it was that Grandma Moses became something of an international artistic sensation, exhibiting her work well into her 90s and painting until a few months before her death at age 101. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed this, and I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And in closing, consider this from the novel A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betsy Smith, published in 1943. Look at everything as though you were seeing it either for the first time or last time. Then your time on earth will be filled with glory.